This time on Gamers Week Podcast. Like Redfall, I get it. That was mm-hmm. a disaster. Wah, um, wah. Right. But <laughs> Hi Fi Rush, I am that when they said that, that that Tango Gameworks was going under, I was just like, what? Uh-huh. Right? It's like, you know, uh, if one of our Olympians won gold and then you, you turned around and I don't Cut know. Cut him from the team. Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, hey, you know what? Thank you for your service. Get the right. hell out of here. Well, you know what, though? <laughs> we got him on the Wheaties box for a couple months and then, yeah. you know, shipped him off to a gulag somewhere. The money's in the endorsements. Yeah. <laughs> Cock ring on a little too tight. Oh, no, my. His chastity cage. <laughs> Is that the thing where they like, they, it's like that metal thing that they, that people can buy nowadays with like the. Yep. They're not always it, metal uh, though. Sometimes they're plastic. Well, what's the fun in that? Because right. <laughs> they say you can take it through airport security. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! They've <laughs> thought of everything, apparently. Yep. They and really you do. know, you know that happened one time. Capitalism, right? Oh, Where somebody went through an airport security and they went, they did the wand. Went, <laughs> <laughs> what is that, sir? <laughs> yep. That's my cock ring. <laughs> like that's why they have like rubber butt plugs, plastic chastity cages, so you can just go in there. Nope. Alarms won't go no, off. No one's the wiser. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine, too, if you, like, say you lived up north, the, the metal ones, if you're outside shoveling snow, get a little cold. There you go. There you go. You Got to protect your, your boy. You nuggets. <laughs> okay. Let me know when we're ready to go. <clears throat> Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, welcome to Gamers Week Podcast. Like the name says, we analyze the best, the worst, and the weirdest headlines of the past week of the video game industry. Today is episode 116, and it is Wednesday, May 8th, 2024. My name is Ryan, a.k.a. Retro Game Brews, and I will be your host for our first podcast back in a while. But as you can see on your screen right now, and if you're listening, you can't see, but I've got two fantastic co-hosts with me. Uh, first of all, is a man who would gladly take a bullet for Stephen Hawking, but is still undecided about Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> but I hear <laughs> he's a sucker for Brian Cox. Donnie G. Retro. <laughs> Donnie, how you doing today? <laughs> What kind of Cox again? <laughs> Brian's uh, Cox? Brian's. Yeah. Brian, it was an Brian's. Oscar Brian's. Yes. Brian's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, if I absolutely had to, yes, I'd take a bullet for Stephen Hawking. Maybe like in the foot or something like that. Or like a meaty Stick part. Stick a foot up. Yeah, There's it's like, levels hey, to it. the sacrifice he's willing to You're do. You're right. Right. Depending on the person, there's levels of sacrifice. So that's <laughs> Stephen Hawking gets the foot. <laughs> <laughs> and the next up, of course, I have a woman who we suspect got sick, had the sick voice that we all love, and to spite us all, has decided to get her lame, normal voice back for our first return show, Blue oh, Williams. Wow. Blue, how you doing? <laughs> you know what? When I start my sick voice OnlyFans, you're blocked. Right <laughs> off the bat. No sick voice for you. None. It is a sacrifice I was willing to make for that joke. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're happy with the transaction. Everybody was coming out of the woodwork to hear Blue Sick Voice fan. Exactly. Or to hear Blue Sick Voice, and then it's gone. And now it's they're going to be dropping like flowers. Oh, sorry. I would like to point out, we were supposed to be back last week, and Ryan's the one who said, no, no, I need one more week. So this is on you. I would love to be able to broadcast my business as to why I wasn't here, but I'm not going to do that. So uh, I will just take it and shut up. Don't worry. I'll just mysteriously hint at it. (laughs) All right. So, you know, of course, we are back from hiatus. But uh, if you're tuned in tonight, you probably already know that Gamers Week will be looking a bit different moving forward. So 
episodes will be streamed live on Twitch every single Wednesday. Uh, we'll do audio releases on Friday as usual. So if you're if you love Gamers Week and that's how you usually connect with it, that won't change. But uh, we'll be cutting a few segments and streamlining others to kind of reduce the production time for each episode. Uh, but we'll still have the news, the laughs everything that you expect from Gamers Week. So uh, we're really excited for this change kind of moving forward, and uh, we hope you guys enjoy it as well. Yes. The production time for each episode up until now, the first 115 episodes, averages between 8 and 12 hours, which is, you know, it's a lot. So we want to keep doing this show. So we're going to try to make things go a bit easier, smoother, and then we can keep doing Gamers Week for a long, long time. For sure. Yeah, everything that we can do to try and make um, our mental health a top priority and our overall health, that is the top priority here. So if any of those get affected, then, you know, it's we we have to make a change. And yeah. it was taking a long time to edit episodes and put together stuff. Um, and of course, Blue, since she primarily edited the main episode um, and I did some uh, cleaning up of the initial the initial episode. But even then, that took like three to four hours to do. So I can only imagine just like what it would be like to have to edit the entire episode. I could tell you. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've done it twice and I How hated it How long do you have? <laughs> right. I uh, uh, got about two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we kind of just jump into it, allow you guys to kind of experience Gamers Week the way you're used to. So let's start off with our first segment, which of course is reviews, reactions, and requests. Okie dokie. So the first one is from Ramboski. The new YouTube format is fucking awesome. Mark, this is <laughs> something I was waiting for <laughs> since I started listening to the uncut episodes. First, I listened to it. Then I had to watch it for more content. Loved it. And thank we you. also thank you, Ramboski. That was really sweet. And we also posted all our past episodes to YouTube, which resulted in new comments on old topics. So Nuff said XXX commented Ooh, on X. episode 22, Water Games Facing Federal Lawsuit. Definite collusion in the graded game market. Prices have already crashed as they are down more than 50% from their auction highs. Let's see where the lawsuit goes from here. I think a settlement will be made at some point, but Water will still have problems in terms of market share. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. I am not shedding a tear whatsoever, if that's the case. <laughs> no. No. And finally, Mark Chong commented on episode 113. Are we on the brink of a video game crash? No. <laughs> Short, straight sweet, to the point. To the point, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Good stuff, Mark. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> That's a guy right. who's being interviewed by the FBI and he's like, <laughs> asking the questions. Did you do? It? Nope. Because they're, they're waiting for the liar to go ahead and just spew like all this stuff, like all these details. He's just, nope. Mark nope. uh, likes like to go on yeah. to, to YouTube uh, strapped to a polygraph <laughs> 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 and comment on uh, random podcasts. Yep. Yep. I love it. All right. So why don't we go ahead and shout out our patrons? We couldn't do what we do without the help of our gorgeous patrons. You are the generous folks supporting Gamers Week on Patreon. Hybrid Divide, Matto1606, You Fall Before Me. Davey PGH, the Red Ox PDX family, including Shannon and Luke, Zach Huge Thanks, Number One Blue Sick Voice Fan, John Baron, Sassy Sony, Evo Lust, Rai Rai Secret Best Friend, Mega Retro Man, Gamma Troid, Moro Deeb, Michael LaKite, Emo Helldivers 2 Mega Ultra Fanboy esque, Bill Tucker, The Real Retro Game Brews, Fruitcakes Pick of Pepper, Ducks with Thick Thighs, Wizard of Zardoz, Bots and Dugnut, Loud Moth, Retro Blast Pat, Great Siaman 81, BNT Zilla Guy, The Mad Milkman, Seven Castle Forest, Crunchy Kong, Sheriff Snacks, Frank Grande, Love Retro BTW, Steven Sand, Ramboski, Terry Kinnair, Doongie Forever, Ducks in Disguise, Don't Make Me Pull Over This Car, and Games with Coffee. If you like what you hear today, and we really hope you do, please consider joining us on Patreon. Your support helps cover the cost of producing the show, as well as other cool stuff we'll be doing like prizes and giveaways. You'll also gain access to our bi-weekly patron-only bonus cast called Gamers Week Uncut, Patrons with Benefits. Visit patreon.com slash gamersweek or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. 
All right, so why don't we go ahead and jump into our headlines for the week. Our headline segment is probably sponsored by the Retro Game Club podcast. It's a fantastic family-friendly retro gaming podcast. In each episode, Rob and Hugh pick two games to play and discuss, as well as news, interviews, and other topics. Right now, they're playing through Dexter and Shadowgate. Visit them at retrogameclub.net or follow the link in the show notes. Dexter, I'm less familiar with, but Shadowgate, I love that game. Me too. Playing it on the NES, you would think it would be awful because <laughs> it's a point and click <laughs> game. But for some reason, it just works. And I can't describe exactly why, but it just seems to fit the genre. Have you played um, Deja Vu? I haven't. So I've always wanted to. Okay. Um, but I am familiar with at least what it is. Uh, I've just never played it myself. Uh, you never played with yourself? I find that hard to believe. I, I would as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember playing Shadowgate on the NES. Um, I remember being over at a friend's house. They had pizza. My my stepbrother was there. He was hanging out. And we were just trying to get through Shadowgate. And most of us couldn't really do it. And really, the trick of that game is if you don't have a walkthrough, you're just moving that cursor like every pixel, clicking on something, clicking on something, and hoping, praying that you actually uncover something. And that's that's how I got through most of the game because I was, uh, there, there are games out there that you just cannot get on the devs level of thinking as to where they would have hidden something or right. how this plays into the the storyline or something like that. And I, I, I use, um, uh, what's the, the game um, with the pirate? Monkey Island. Monkey Island. <laughs> no, uh, I was like, you're going to have to be more specific, sir. <laughs> Secret of Monkey Island. Yeah. Trying to play through that game. I love those types of games, but some of it is just so crazy and corny that I never would have really thought to do this or do that. So that's kind of what Shadowgate uh, held for me back then. And I will admit that uh, my first experience with Shadowgate was not when I owned like the NES originally. It wasn't back in like the, the, early, to the early 90s, late 80s. It was now, right? In the last yeah. probably seven or eight years so i had game facts that's to, why to, you love to draw it. upon yeah so yeah for me at least it was a really fun experience right from the get-go but uh i can see that being pretty frustrating i tried to play through maniac mansion the first time without like knowing anything yes yes <laughs> that was a frustrating experience but i stumbled upon <laughs> microwaving a certain animal <laughs> in that game uh without being prompted and i was very proud of that because like uh, apparently that was an easter egg or something so it's like, yes, look at me. <laughs> well, at least you microwaved it and you didn't stick it on your hand. <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't say I didn't, though. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to move on to the headlines, but we're starting like a new format for the headlines where we're going to run through a couple of quick headlines at the top of the segment. Ones that really don't need a full like six minute discussion like we would normally do, but we still think they're worth mentioning. So first off, Nintendo has said it will finally announce its Switch successor console within this fiscal year. So at some point before March 31st, 2025, in a statement published to Twitter slash X... <laughs> Shintaro Furukawa, <laughs> president of Nintendo, confirmed the new console as Nintendo published its financial report for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Furukawa also confirmed a Nintendo Direct for this June, as is tradition, but said there will be no mention of the Switch successor during that presentation. Instead, it will focus on Switch games for the latter half of 2024. Which makes sense, right? Yeah. Because I'm excited it, for this, though. Yeah. Which but one? <laughs> both? <laughs> but um, it will be announced at some point before March 31st, 2025. That's just for the announcement. So we may not see this thing right. for a long time. Right, right. right. And I mean, we could speculate on what it's going to be. Um, I personally don't think that they're going to go away from the docking station format. That has no. worked so well for them. No. And I think Furukawa did come out and say it's very much a next iteration of the Switch, a Switch gotcha. 2. It's not a, a not a big technology jump or something. So. But what is it going to look um, like? <laughs> is it going to be a handheld Sega Genesis Model 1? I, I mean, like, I, would, I would play that. I would support that. I mean, <laughs> we, we went through a cycle of things were bigger, then they went smaller. Now they seem to be going bigger again. Which so, I'm not a fan of. No? I'm, well, I mean, for 
certain reasons. Yeah, no um, comment. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me take the switch, make it a little bit bigger, make it the size of a Model One Sega Genesis with a big screen in there, and what, give it give it that kind of uh, that dial up. And let me put it in my my knapsack or whatever, my my shoulder bag and everything like that. That's how I carry my new Switch Two. I'm okay. I with gotta that. be honest with you. I don't know if that's going to make it quite past the focus group because <laughs> you got to hand it to to to, to children. <laughs> focus groups don't know anything. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. But I could be on the focus group. It'll make it past <laughs> me. <laughs> yes, I'm wearing you, a damn thing. You are the demographic that they are looking for. <laughs> it's Donnie and thirty. Nine year olds. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm strong arming them to give it a good review. Listen, guys, <laughs> I'm gonna say you like this. All right. And next, following last week's ratings board sighting, Nintendo has officially unveiled Nintendo World Championships NES Edition, which promises over 150 challenges from across 13 different NES games when it launches on July 18th. As per Nintendo's announcement, Nintendo World Championships NES Edition is specifically concerned with speedrunning, featuring 150 bite-sized challenges that can be tackled across several modes. I absolutely love this. This was a fantastic idea. Whoever came up with it, it wasn't me. I'm not that smart. But my (laughs) goodness, this is going to sell like gangbusters. You will not see this, the hype of this go down on Twitch for months, maybe a year or more, uh, because people are going to go after 150 different challenges. Think about all of the opportunities to do world records, for people to expand upon that. I think that there are it's going to the speed running community specifically is going to fall in love with this. And I think honestly, it will probably sell more Nintendos. Honestly, at the end of the day, people who wouldn't normally go for a Nintendo console are going to pick <laughs> one up in order to, to in, get themselves involved with this. And I think that's great. I was going to say, Dad, they're going to get a Nintendo's. <laughs> a Nintendo. <laughs> what does that even mean? A Nintendo's. <laughs> so Nintendo. this thing is hey, actually. The, the the NES cart that comes with it, you can't play it on the NES. Correct. It's Correct. just a display thing. So uh, the Switch actually comes with a, uh, a a cartridge that you can play on the Switch, though, for all these uh, different things. Correct. Right. So when you say they're going to be buying Nintendos, do you mean Switches? I or, do. I do. Okay. okay. <laughs> right. Or do you do you really think that people are going to go out and buy original Nintendos, the original hardware with all of these original games on there, and try to do it that way? If there's going to be some people who will, is well, what I'll say. Because that will be a separate world record, though, right? Well, yeah, as versus I understand, though, on original hardware versus what's the, ever the little yes. bite-sized challenge in this one. Yes. This will be a separate world record. Correct. But, but you can't play that, that cart, though, on the NES. So it's no, just No, but show. I'm just saying, like, I don't even know what it would be. Like, let's say it would be that damn uh, karate game that I hate. Kung Fu. Uh, Kung Fu, right. Ah, yes. So they have like a level of Kung Fu in this uh, NES, what is it? NES World Championships thing. So if you get the level I there, you don't get a Kung Fu World um, a Kung Fu record. World record. Right, right, right. I see what you're saying. So all of a yeah. sudden it's going to open up an entire category on like, you know, uh, speed run or speed, not speed archives. It's, I think just. Speedrun.org or something like is that. Is that speedrun.net speed or speedrun.org? I think yeah. so. Okay. Do you not know Donnie with all your world records? You don't know. Uh, I do. I, I've got world records. I don't have speed run world records except for the turtles. <laughs> excuse thing, so. me. Excuse yeah. me. He's got yeah. twin galaxies. My which, bad. But, My bad. Know, still My world question. Record. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. But I, I'd like to get Mega Retro Man's take on this because he sure. does. He tries to do the Nintendo World Championship. Uh, he tries to reclaim his spot. There's this other guy that he competes back and forth with. Um, but how does that work when you don't have an original Nintendo World Championship card? Do they allow the emulator, like an official Nintendo World Championship emulator, that you are able to do that? So how can you say I've reclaimed this world record when you can't really – it's not listed anywhere? Well, and I think one of the, the stipulations on that website is original hardware emulator, and I'm sure they'll add a third category for, for this uh-huh. maybe. Right. Or maybe they'll just consider this emulator. I don't know. I would think so. That's probably what yeah. it is. Oh, absolutely. 100%. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. And next up, the World Video Game Hall of Fame induction ceremony will be back in person for the first time since 2019 at the Strong National Museum of Play. 
There we go. Pause so Ryan can show off his sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be held in the new World Video Game Hall of Fame Rotunda at 10.30 a.m. on May 9th, which is tomorrow. Whoa. The 2024 Hall of Fame class will be announced during a special ceremony at ESL Digital Worlds. So tomorrow we'll get to see who correctly predicted the new inductees. And as a reminder, Donnie chose Guitar Hero, Ryan chose Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and I went with Resident Evil. And you know, there all is, three of safe bets. Yeah, I was gonna say there's a <laughs> there's a reality where all three of us are successful because of the way we did our picks this year. But again, Thursday curse. Yes. Our first episode. Right. Back. Our first episode back. <laughs> there's a Thursday time. curse. I mean, it's probably not going to be as as uh, a fun of a headline as it was last year with freaking Barbie fashion designers, which we got so <laughs> much mileage out of Barbie fashion designers. <laughs> so it's probably not going to be that fun. It's probably going to be like, yeah, I expected those. All right. So our first article tonight from PC Mag: PlayStation accounts won't be required for Hell Divers Two PC players. Following extensive player backlash, Sony has walked back its plans to require PC players of Helldivers 2 to link their Steam accounts with the PlayStation Network PSN account. The requirement had previously been scheduled to take effect May 6th. Now it will be optional for PC players of the third-person sci-fi shooter. Players expressed frustration at the sudden requirement because PSN accounts aren't available in every country. This would have meant that gamers in 177 countries, mainly nations in the Middle East, the Caribbean, and Africa, would have no longer been able to play Helldivers 2 without a VPN. And I think that this was just a bullshit move. Mark it, 853. <laughs> oh, yeah, 2811, 20, got it. Um, this, you, you institute this type of policy well after the game has come out. You made no mention prior right. that, oh, you have to have a PSA. They did? It was in the fine print. It was... From Nobody the beginning, going to be print. a requirement. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> it, from the beginning, they intended this to be the requirement, even though nobody was aware of it. So you you know that people – so you release this game on PC, right? And Sony right. really doesn't do a lot – or they didn't do a lot of that previously. It was always on the console itself, on the PlayStation itself. You have to play it on the PlayStation. Now they're relaxing that a bit. But they're saying, hey, you kind of need to you know, create a PSN account. Well, I don't want a PS. Why, why do I need a PlayStation Network account if right. I can play the game on the PC? It, it, it doesn't. If I already have that avenue of playing the game, why in the hell do I need a PlayStation account? I think this was a horrible move by Sony for doing this. And now people have lost a lot of confidence in them. Right, right. And the question I have to ask is, why is this so important to them that you create a PSN account? I, I, you know, through all the reading I did for it, they never mentioned what specific advantage the player gets, PlayStation gets by them creating a PSN account. Well, it was meant to be for additional security. Got it. You okay. also know it was because PlayStation wanted people to buy microtransactions through their store, naturally, not right? Through Steam. Got right. That I so, think was a much larger part of it. So two things that are, are good for PlayStation. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Any and for the player? <laughs> no, it was well, the security. The security is good for the player. You mm. want your account to be secure, don't you? Right. But I think it's pretty secure because, right now on my PC. Well, S Sony has never like just recently in the past couple of months had giant data breaches. That that never happened. Never, right? No, no, no. Never, no, no. no, they never don't get happens. attacked by North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> I was so sad, though, because knowing that we were going to be starting up again this week and keeping an eye on this, and it was such a huge deal. Everybody was so pissed off. Like, the internet was straight up on fire, and I was like, yes, this is going to be so good to talk about. <laughs> and then, like, within within 72 hours, Sony said, yeah, our bad. Please stop screaming. Please put down the pitchforks. <laughs> we'll, we'll forget about the requirement. Coward. What did this remind you of? What did this remind you of? Um, lots of, lots of times that, right, that right. corporations have decided they wanted to do something and then everybody freaks out and they walk it back. I immediately thought of the whole Unreal Engine um, fiasco that happened. Uh, well, I don't even remember the guy's name. But you remember that thing where they were, they were going to start charging developers for like yes. X amount, like whatever they were going to be uh, like, oh, if, if you install this and then we're going to get a little bit of this and you're going to have to pay more and yada, yada, yada. And then they walked it back. And I think that guy ended up even getting fired. He did. Right. He got fired. Okay. Yep. 
Unity. Yeah, sorry. Unity. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's Unity. why I was like, I needed some time. I was going to find it. But uh, the <laughs> chat, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you, Hybrid Divide. Unity yep. was the one. And you, you yeah, that was a big me. one. I, this clearly was a case where, I mean, Helldivers 2 was probably going to be game of the year. It's hands oh, yeah. down the most successful game of 2024. And mm-hmm. this was a case where... It was in the fine print before, so Sony always intended this. And as you said, Ryan, normally in in the past, they've always had to, players have always had to play on PlayStation. And this is more or less one of Sony's first real forays into Steam with a successful game. And so maybe Mm -hmm. they're just trying it out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. I would bet 100% that the next big game that they release on Steam will have this requirement day one. Yeah, day one. They're not going to let this happen again. But does that limit their player base? Are people just going to not sign up for a game because of this PSN account stuff? Well, that clearly didn't concern them because they were still going to implement it despite the fact that there's no PSN in 177 countries. Which to me is wild. That's I mean, there's, I think, what, like 212 countries across the globe. So we're only talking about 40 countries would have access to this. That's I mean, granted. Probably a large population of the world lives in those 40 countries, but still, right. uh, that's that's a huge hit uh, for people who want to play games that probably will never pick up a PlayStation moving forward here if this were to continue to go into play. So what advantage would that have been providing Sony? It's just alienating their player base outside. Of, yeah, you're you know. going like this. Do you have more control and more money from your smaller player base? And does that equal more dollars than it does to opening it up to the whole world and just getting the price for the sale of the game? Right. That's true. Who knows? I personally would think you'd want players all over the world to be continue enjoying this game that has been a runaway success. Uh, and you hope that... Sony hasn't shot itself in the foot as far as this game's long-term success. For sure. And I, sure. I got to say that I think you are limiting your player base. You want your game to be global. The yeah. Hands down. You and have based to in, on, this, in this day and age. Of course. Back in the old days, whenever uh, video game development um, you know, was, was not as profound as it is now, you were saying, okay, who is my target audience? What countries am I going to release this game on or in? Because the uh, this, these countries don't like these types of games. These, this country doesn't like these types of games. Now you want this to reach globally. And for Sony to now say that, well, anytime that we release a game on PC, you have to assume that we're you're going to need a PlayStation account. Right. And if you don't have a PlayStation account, then, well, then you just can't play the game. You yeah, know what? Sorry. Screw your accounts. <laughs> Move Go to a back better to country. T- yeah, that, that's always the option. <laughs> Back up, renounce your citizenship, and move to a country that allows you to to give us your money. Yep, that's and I that's think Robert Divide right made a fantastic point. He says that's super shady. Sony knows that they will require the PSN and sells a game to countries with no PSN access. Right, I agree. Very, very shady. Yeah, but like I said, I think they just have no idea what they're doing right now. And this is going to, you know, chalk one up to the uh, playbook. And <laughs> next time they will do things very, very differently. Like, so if you're always trying out something new, the, the first goal is to not piss everybody off. <laughs> Failed you think that so. One. <laughs> yeah. But this is the video game industry we're talking about. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right? <laughs> they make a living pissing everyone off. <laughs> Which is a nice segue to the next. Right, I was going to say. And <laughs> Sony pisses everyone off. Let's see what the other side of the aisle is doing. <laughs> it was really nice of, of Xbox to say, you know what? Our, our good buddy Sony, I have the crosshairs on him this week. Let's see what we can do to take that <laughs> off of them. So next up from VGC, how can any Xbox studio trust Microsoft now? Xbox is closing down four Bethesda studios, including Redfall developer Arcane Austin and Hi-Fi Rush studio Tango Gameworks. The problem Microsoft faces, and it was one that was entirely of its own making, is that now it owns a string of studios working on games that, when compared to Activision Blizzard titles, will barely move the needle in terms of revenue growth. That puts everyone on Microsoft's early acquisition in a horrible position. In Exile, Double Fine, Undead Labs, Ninja Theory, and Obsidian Entertainment all make fantastic games, some of which have had have been massive hits for the studio for their scale. But put alongside World of Warcraft and Call of Duty, they're small fry. 
In his statement announcing yesterday's studio closure, Xbox Game Studio head Matt Booty said these changes (laughs) rocking everywhere. (laughs) These changes are grounded in prioritizing high impact titles and furthering investing in Bethesda portfolio of blockbuster games. I am going to be so freaking pissed if Microsoft bought or if Xbox bought Double Fine, whom I love, just Mm -hmm. to shut it down a year later. Right. No, no. <laughs> Literally, the eat them up and sh- them out, you know? <laughs> yeah. Th- this much. is nothing new. But right. I proposed this question in the Discord to our patrons. What's to keep a studio like In Exile from regrouping? So those people get shuttered. That studio gets shuttered. These people are like, hey, we made a fantastic game on our own. We don't right. need Microsoft. Let's go ahead and let's get some capital. Let's put together like, hey, we, we did this. We did this. Some people fund them. Now they're another indie studio. They create another banger. Is this a rent or wash, rinse, repeat kind of thing where all of a sudden Microsoft or Sony comes back? It's like, hey, we see that you uh, you made this game. Do you want to do you want to go ahead? And can we buy you out? And at that point, I would think if you've already succumbed to that once, you know, shame, shame on you. Fool me once. Uh, can't, can't fool me again. Is that the case? Do you, do you like depending on how many dollars they come at you with and say, like, hey, we're going to give you uh, three hundred million dollars to we're going to buy you out. And, you know, does does money take precedent there or do these people have like the, the due diligence to say, you know what, you already did this to or one big studio already did it to us once. Um, we're, we're successful with these games that we make. So why don't we just stay how we are and stay independent? And the problem that you run into that is that you're going to have Xbox or Sony uh, say, well, we won't put your game on our system if you don't sell to us. Now, yeah. granted, they probably won't say exactly that, but it will be implied uh, so that they don't get in trouble for extortion. The other piece to this, though, is that the people who are losing are not the guys who sold their studios to Microsoft. They're not the executives who are going to get a golden parachute as a result of these studios shutting down. It's the people who are the developers, the the people that come in every single day and make those games uh, that are going to be impacted by this. And so if you were to to your point, if all of a sudden I decided to create another studio, um, I don't know if the owners of that one looking at that payday would say, well, I don't care. I'm just going to get paid hundreds of millions of dollars from this group. Right. I'm fine with that. I can move forward. And if the the employees that are here that are developing it get laid off, I'm no longer part of the company, so I don't care. Yeah. Well, and I that's mean, scary. You have to understand, I think also that uh, Microsoft now owns that studio name. It owns your previous IPs. So you're starting yep. over from scratch and hoping that your fans would follow you, would recognize right. you. Another right. thing is that not all those employees are being laid off. Some of them are being repurposed sure. and directed back to Actibliz games, which are the money Actibliz. makers. So you don't know if there would be enough of your your indie studio left over to start over or if you would get together with somebody else or if everybody's just, just so discouraged and it won't even matter. Because I got to believe that that's the long-term goal of a lot of indie studios is you want to be profitable. And the easiest way to be profitable and to get your game out there to people is to be bought out. And now right. that that dream has proven that it's just a bunch of bullshit market, that a lot of the the rage has been around Tango Gameworks with Hi-Fi Rush because that was one of the best games of 2023, I believe, is when it came Easily. out. And Microsoft couldn't stop singing its praises. And so if you make the best game that your little studio can possibly make, it's wildly successful for its own scale, but it can't compete with freaking Call of Duty, then what's even the point of starting an indie studio? Right. At the end of the day, if the only fo- if Microsoft's only focus is Bethesda and Actibliz, um, I got to say... What's going to be coming out of Microsoft is nothing like what we want as players. It's going to be all the things that we hate uh, about those types of games. You know, the microtransactions, the games as a service. And I wonder what impact that's going to have on the gaming community at large. Are people just going to become disinterested and disengaged with gaming because it's all cookie cutter from the same studios over and over again? The point of having these indie studios and that indie studio explosion that happened in the last 10 years, the great part about that is that it's increased the amount of variability in gameplay, storytelling, and design. Without that 
and that competition that's in there and that ability to create games that are a little bit outside the mainstream, that's going to have a huge impact on gamers, I think, that like us, where we're not looking for that specific Call of Duty World of Warcraft experience. I don't like that. That to me is a harbinger of bad things to come. And even though gaming has exploded in the last 10 years and become a huge multi-billion dollar industry, I don't know if limiting choices for gamers is the route that's going to continue to, to make it grow. So is this the, the death rattle of Microsoft being and, in the video no, game business? Because as long as Call of Duty exists. Damn. <laughs> Donnie got excited. I've, I've never liked the fact that Microsoft was in the home console business. They should have sure. just stuck to PC games. Because I, I, I didn't. I was, I was like, the Xbox? What the? What's the Xbox going to give me that the PlayStation doesn't already do? What's the Xbox 360 going to give me that the, that this console doesn't really already do? So, and now that they're making all these bullshit decisions to shutter studios that they bought in, not to mention the fact that they bought a studio or they, or they buy multiple studios that are making similar games. And now you're competing against a, if you're part of a studio that's making a certain type of game and you get purchased by Microsoft that already has a studio that's making that type of game. What's the fucking point? Mark it. Got it. <laughs> well, I think this is just, this is Xbox just trying to vacuum up as much cash as it possibly can. I think we'll still have Nintendo. They don't appear to be making any sort of moves to where this is nope. limiting indie studios on their platform. And the Switch is one of the best platforms for indie games anyway. So that's not mm -hmm. going to sure. change. PlayStation is still butthurt that they didn't get ActaBliss. So they're probably, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they were sitting there ready and willing to vacuum up these types of studios as well. I don't think they're going to go away. It's just like Xbox is becoming more and more one note as right. time goes on. Right. And limiting their ability to stay in the game. Right. They want it. They keep saying, oh, we want to expand our player base. We want more and more daily users. We want more people to sign up for, for Xbox Gold or Live or whatever the hell that is they called it now. But when you start only <laughs> getting rid of interesting games that are different, that have the ability to attract new types of people and just say, we're going to only focus on ActaBliz because it's our biggest moneymaker. Well, then, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe this is the 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 indication that Microsoft may be looking to get out of the game from a console perspective. Which I mean, they have talked about I know so for, often yeah. for long, right? And um, I really, their best bet is probably just to be another Steam mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And for them, at least, this would be the most pro profitable way to do that without actually scaring away people who are buying their current console is to just eliminate all the studios that might cost them a little bit more money from a margins perspective, get the games that uh, are wildly popular, that have all of these skins and, and opportunities to, to get cash on top of that. That would that would be the play. I, I got to be honest, if I was sitting on that board and that's what you wanted to do, this is the, the formula I would probably try. But why not both? I'm not that uh, <laughs> again for me at least, but I'm, I'm saying that they're trying to, to eliminate uh, costs, right? And these small studios are not making as much from a margins perspective. They're dead weight for them. No, they're not dead weight if, as long as they're not losing money. They're not dead weight. But we're just thinking of profit and loss. There's probably a lot of other time spent with these studios that they could be moving assets and resources over to these big names. I mean, you talked about it anyway. They're not laying off everybody. They're yeah. repurposing them. You could repurpose these people or bring in people for a cheaper rate, whatever it is, um, and still operate and get to, to that point in which where you could just become another Steam if you wanted to. And per that article, per the shareholders, if they don't see growth – then that's a failure. So if these if these little smaller studios are just stagnant, they're not really doing a lot for for Microsoft as a whole. Then well, they, they can be okay, cut and fair. Let go. If they're stagnant, but if they make one of the best games of the year, they should be allowed to stay. Yeah, Hi Fi. I mean, Hi Fi rushed. Absolutely. Yeah. That that to me was the biggest. Like Redfall, I get it. That was mm -hmm. a disaster. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> right, but Hi-Fi Rush. I am that when they said that 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 Tango GameWorks was going under, I was just like, what? Uh -huh. Right? 
It's like, you know, uh, if one of our Olympians won gold and then you, you turned around and I don't Cut know. Cut him from the team. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, hey, you know what? Thank you for your service. Get the right. hell out of here. Well, you know what, though? We got him on the Wheaties box for a couple months and then, yeah. you know, shipped him off to a gulag somewhere. The money's in the endorsements. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Microsoft. Hmm. If only we understood what's going through that booty's head. <laughs> The booty's head? What? <laughs> All right. So why don't we go ahead and jump into our top three new releases for the week? All right. Some interesting choices this week. Mm-hmm. First up is Crow Country out on PS5, Xbox Series, X and S, and PC. The year is 1990. It's been two years since the mysterious disappearance of Edward Crow and the abrupt closure of his theme park, Crow Country. But your arrival has broken the silence. If you want answers, you'll have to venture deep into the darkness of Crow Country to find them. I watched the trailer, and this looks like if Silent Hill or Resident Evil had been made in Final Fantasy VII style. Yes, right. yes, right. absolutely. Right. Yep. Next up, Little Kitty Big City, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. You're a curious little kitty with a big personality on an adventure to find your way back home. Explore the city, make new friends with stray animals, wear delightful hats, and leave more than a little chaos in your wake. After all, isn't that what cats do best? If you love stray, you're probably going to love this because it looks like if uh, the goose game was with a cat. <laughs> right. <laughs> you kitty you're going to spend the night outside 48 25. <laughs> <laughs> and our last is v rising out on pc awaken as a vampire hunt for blood in nearby settlements to regain your strength and evade the scorching sun to survive raise your castle and thrive in an ever-changing open world full of mystery gain allies online and conquer the land of the living so this one looks like if diablo and castlevania had a baby love it exactly what i was thinking so, what are you in for, Donnie? Uh, definitely not Little Kitty, Big City. Uh, I didn't play Stray. <laughs> See, there was gonna there's there's jokes there, and I'm just gonna leave them alone. Yeah. <laughs> it does no. not. Uh, Wait, your Wait your turn. Wait your turn. Yeah, yeah, and then we'll yeah. hear the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think the jokes belong on this show at all. <laughs> Plus, I'm allergic to cats, so I'm not going to go with this one. More um, possible initially, yep. <laughs> Walking away. Not that kind of allergy. Now, when I saw Crow Country, <laughs> that's immediately what I thought of, what Blue described. It looks like um, Silent Hill or D or Clock Tower yeah, or whatever D. that was made uh, in Final Fantasy VII-esque. It looks, it looks pretty good. I just don't know how scary – it's going to be with it looking like a little cartoonish and, and whatnot. But, um, you know, me, I'm a sucker for horror games. Uh, mm-hmm. The more modern stuff like Madison and um, Vi- Visage. Yeah, Ma- Madison and Visage. Those are mm-hmm. the really the kind of games that get my heart pumping and sweating and shaking and all that stuff. I just don't know if Crow Country is really going to be able to do that. I'm still considering checking it out. But my top pick this week is going to be V Rising. Like, again, like Blue said, it looks like... Castlevania and Diablo had a baby and it looks like I, I started watching the trailer and I'm like, I'm all in for this. Right. The only thing is it says, build a cat, raise your castle. What, what does that mean? Am I building stuff in here? Am I, is it like a building sim where I go in here and, and do something here? And next thing you know, this pops up. Do I have to farm crap to, you know, like what, what's the uh, animal crossing or some crap like that? <laughs> Somehow I feel like you're not going to be farming for vampires. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, though. Like, no, no, I, I get you. I get you. I get you. Because if it's got that little aspect of it in the game, I think I might be able to sacrifice that due to what the content holds. So I love vampires. Uh, I love the fact that they have vampire Diablo-esque type game. So mm-hmm. for me, it's going to be V Rising. Nice. Ryan? Uh, so I'm going to go with the same sentiment about Little Kitty Big City. <laughs> um, I know that you were expecting me to this to be my choice for the week, but... Uh, I know you love yeah. cats. <laughs> I'm, I'm such cat. a huge, huge fan of cats. They, they, oh, man, I wanted to make a joke, but I'm not going to do it because it's wrong. I can't podcast. win here. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely not my bag. Uh, Stray was interesting, uh, but nothing that about it said hey ryan you really really need to play this so 
if it's like Stray, then I am definitely not in for that one. Crow Country, I like the fact that it's in a theme park. So few games, and especially horror games, are set in that setting. And I Which think, is crazy because they're right, creepy as hell. Right. And, and the right. thing is, too, like if you look at like Zombie Land, that movie, like the end part is in a theme park. And that fits perfectly because there's just so much going on. The only one I could think of off the top of my head was uh, Carnival. Carnival. That's <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, that, that's the only one. <laughs> Uh, so I'm definitely interested in checking it out. You're right. The, the, the graphics may not play into that, but I got to be honest with you. I played uh, Clock Tower on the Super Nintendo and those graphics weren't great and I still jumped no. a bunch of times. So uh, <laughs> it's possible is all I'm saying. Uh, I'm but V Rising looks bad ass as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I love that you're awakening as a vampire. <clears throat> I love the idea of being kind of the anti-hero uh, in that sense you know you're doing dastardly deeds but for the right cause i dunder guess cheap. that dunder chief right <laughs> me do it dunder 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 cheap. Cheap. i don't think i've ever beat donnie to a music reference before <laughs> <laughs> this is an auspicious day it is, I it wanted is. to say it, but I didn't want to be cliche and and and, and interrupt. So. Oh, please! We are so cliche on this yeah. podcast. <laughs> you have made so many corny dad jokes. Don't even try. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, I think this is going to be super cool. Uh, uh, the fact that it's on PC less uh, it's a barrier sometimes for me for PC games because I'm just not good at AWSD. But um, this one doesn't necessarily look like it's going to be a problem with that. So I'm all in. I'm going to say V Rising. Very nice. nice. Lou, what about you? Yeah, I will kind of go with the same sentiment, although sort of. I think I could have fun with any of these games. A little kitty, big city. That looks like the kind of game like I could get together with my sisters, have a few drinks, and just laugh all night long. Uh, Crow Country. I have played a lot of indie horror games where the the graphics are kind of so-so and then they end up being spectacular games. So the graphics don't bother me at all. I'm in for that one. But V Rising, I wanted to double check that it it has a single player mode because it also says gain allies online. Nah. But it does have a single player mode so it should be good there. I may hold out for the, hopefully what's an inevitable switch port, fingers crossed. But that is my top pick, followed closely by Crow Country, Little Kitty, Big City as third. Not bad. <laughs> Good week. <laughs> now, kitty, that's a bad kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, kitty's being a dildo. <laughs> I know a certain uh, kitty kitty who's sleeping in Just do it in case. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because the last uh, four have been done here. <laughs> wow. And we're all shocked. Shocked. <laughs> all right. So before we move on, let's take a quick break to talk about our sponsor. This segment is proudly sponsored by a Gamer Looks at 40 podcast. The show explores the history of video games through the stories and experiences of the people who lived it. On this week's episode, Bill begins his multi Part deep dive into Final Fantasy IV, one of my favorites. So I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, so the, this week's question is, of the Super Nintendo North American launch library, so that's Super Mario, Bro- or Super Mario World, uh, Pilot Wings, SimCity, Gradius, and F-Zero, which would you take as your desert Ooh. island game? Yes. So let Bill Ooh. know your answer by sending him a tweet to at it at at. It's definitely not at at. Uh, gamers <laughs> looks at forty on Twitter. <laughs> oh, that's a tough question. Is it? If that's... you're not picking Super Mario World, are you drunk? Uh, currently. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? You beat Super Mario World, then you take a break for a month and you come back and play it again and you just keep wash, rinse, repeat? Well, there's, I mean, you can do like the star, stars. yeah, the star road and mm-hmm. you can you know, play easy. it just straight or you oh, can try star to. star road is easy? Yes. I think next game stream, we need you to prove that. Uh, okay. I and, like and, this and challenge. I, <laughs> and I've proven the fact that uh, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, uh, the whole secret levels were easy because I did that too. Those were easier than Star Road. Bullsh**. They were. Yeah, they were. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm really looking forward to our next stream. <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, 
I, I would go with SimCity. There's a lot more variability in that. You can change things up uh, every time you play it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But every time you play it, it could be different where, you know, yeah. playing F-Zero, F-Zero, Gradius, Pilot Wings, it's all the same every time you play it. So it's it's about that replayability. I think SimCity's got it. I, I'm willing to say the same here. Um, I love Super Sim Mario City, really? Yeah, I love Super Mario World. I love it. It's one of my favorite all-time games. But if I'm stuck on a desert island and I know exactly, like, it's going to get tiresome playing the same levels over and over again. Just like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Could you do that one more time for me? (laughs) 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 See how long I can just keep flying, keep floating and all that stuff. Like, oh, it's been, it's been, it's been three days and I can take it. (laughs) <laughs> you're right with the variability sim city would be it, it would be a brand new game every time that you played it so that that's going to be my desert island game love it see i, I expected mr aerobiz supersonic to go for sim city <laughs> you surprised me and that just proves that i'm right <laughs> does it does that's it? it it's my story and i'm sticking to it <laughs> Well, hey there, fellow kids. It's time to go back to when things were simpler. Before game companies took up living space in our bank accounts, before battle passes, when gaming magazines ruled and midnight releases were legendary. It's time to take a trip back to yesteryear. This is the Retro Rewind for May 1997. Let's take a look at some of the top Billboard songs and their artists for this month. Notorious B.I.G. with Hypnotize. Puff Daddy, Can't Nobody Hold Me Down. I (laughs) disagree with you on that one. (laughs) How topical. (laughs) (laughs) Jewel with Foolish Games. Monica, For You, I Will. Savage Garden with I Want You. Ooh, I want you. I don't know if I need you. Spice Girls with Wannabe. Love it. Wow. Classic. Mark Morrison with Return of the Mac. Oh, Lord. Return, Return of the Mac. Oh, my God. <laughs> you sound like the old guy from Family Guy. <laughs> As yet with Hard to Say I'm Sorry. Paula Cole with Where Have All the Cowboys Gone. And B Rock and the Biz. <laughs> My baby, daddy. You hate nice. Paula Cole? Where they have all the cowboys gone? It's I just don't like that song. I just overplayed. Uh, yeah, a thousand percent overplayed. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of songs that have been overplayed, and yeah, I, this is one of them. How did the theaters this month? Twister, Twister, one. I love no, Twister. actually, no S, just, just one tornado. The suck zone. The suck zone. <laughs> Mission Impossible. The truth about cats and dogs. The craft. Bringing validation to goth girls everywhere. Hello. The Quest. <laughs> Primal Fear, which is such an amazing movie. I have not seen it. Oh, you've not seen that with Edward Norton and uh, Richard Gere? I have Dude, not. Do yourself a favor and watch that. It is a masterpiece. I've got homework. Spy Hard. Flipper. The Birdcage. <laughs> I'm also making that a sound on the show. <laughs> <laughs> And James and the Giant Peach. Hot at the Arcades this month was Tekken 3, Darkstalkers, Jetta's Damnation, Sega Super GT, Mm -hmm. and Rampage World Tour. Ah. Still making Rampage games up to that point. (laughs) (laughs) In video game news, Sega to merge with Bandai. Two wobbly companies have merged to form one really big wobbly company. That's what's (laughs) up. And somebody yelled, Jenga! (laughs) And it all fell down. (laughs) That's what some financial analysts are saying after Sega and Bandai got together in February and morphed into a huge new company to be called Sega Bandai. The deal, worth over $1 billion, should be finalized October 1st. The merger comes at a time when both companies are struggling for an identity in the video games market. Both Sega and Bandai have taken serious financial hits in recent years after finding success earlier in the decade. 
Sega, locked in third place in the system wars behind Nintendo and Sony, had already announced that it would lose an incredible $200 million in the fiscal year that ended March 31st. Bandai, best known for creating the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, has seen that license take a nosedive since 1995. I wonder why. (laughs) <laughs> What's more, the Apple Pippin, the game system for kids that Bandai sunk $130 million into, has been a disaster, according to most analysts. <laughs> according Bandai, to everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like the four out of five dentists recommend. So four out of five analysts say the Apple Pippin was a disaster. We need I to consider get that myself other guy. an analyst. You know, though, I, I got to be honest. Yeah, the future is going to decide on that one. I, I think I, I, I might come around. <laughs> The new Sega Bandai regime will be headed by familiar names. The chairman will be Sega's current chairman, Asayo Okawa. Bandai's president, Makoto Yamashima, will assume the role of Sega Bandai's president. What? Bandai's president, (laughs) Makoto Yamashina, will assume the role of Sega Bandai's president. Okay, that just tripped me out for a second. The the big wobbly company. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) They'll oversee a company with over $6 billion in revenue and about 400 U.S. employees working in Northern California. Their mission will be to successfully meld. Yeah, they said meld. Sega's it should be mold. Meld. Sega's video game potential, its coin-op titles, and its arcane arcade holdings in Japan and the U.S. with Bandai's toy products. High on Bandai's hot list of products right now is the latest toy addiction in Japan, a key ring with an electronic egg. Called the Tamagotchi. Yes. The gadget features an electronic chick that grows to adulthood if properly nourished. Just like me. (laughs) Sega's long-term rival responded to the news with a big yawn. Nintendo spokesperson said they had no worries about the new Sega Bandai, flush with its remarkable Nintendo 64 success in the U.S. (laughs) Nintendo is plenty busy these days trying to ramp up production of of the N64s to meet the worldwide demand. The company hopes to ship a million N64s around the world every month, up from 700,000 a month, just as the system is about to launch in Europe. Good luck. Yeah, how'd that yeah. go? <laughs> I don't think it went well at all. I wonder if Bandai, when they got in that boardroom and they decided to meld those companies together, they played that, I'll stop the world and melt, and melt with, you. with you. Yeah, we got it, our theme song, man. <laughs> High fiving and stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> White like corporate execs high five. Like, yeah, <laughs> 80s freeze frame high five. <laughs> and Saturn owners worried about their system's future can worry a little less thanks to one arcade hit and four hugely popular PC games. The arcade game is Max TT Superbike. A motorcycle racing game that'll utilize the Saturn's analog controller. It's going to be the savior. Additionally, Sega has allied with GT Interactive to bring two of the biggest PC sellers ever, Duke Nukem 3D and Quake, to the Saturn this summer. The announcement is a coup for Sega because this will be the first time that Quake has appeared on a console system. Some new features will be added to make the games different from their PC versions, and Duke will have a multiplayer option using the Netlink, according to a Sega spokesperson. Also coming to the Saturn and the PlayStation as well are two PC strategy games from Blizzard Entertainment, Diablo and Warcraft 2, both due at the end of the year. This is my favorite part about going back to these old news articles. Right. Is knowing what we know now and going, "Uh aha, sure. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like this is like a weatherman prediction, right? Where they, (laughs) everything they did was turned out to be wrong and yep. They probably still have a job somewhere, so. Yeah, Yeah, probably. Hot at Blockbuster this month for the N64 was Mario Kart 64, Turok Dinosaur Hunter, Doom 64, FIFA Soccer 64, and Blast Core. We get it. It's on the 64. You don't need to add 64 after every single game. (laughs) I'm disappointed it's not in every title, man. How would they know? (laughs) So for the PlayStation, it's Need for Speed 3 PSX, NBA Shootout 97 PSX, Soul Blade, Independence Day, Spider and Mega Man 8. I was so excited, so excited for Independence Day because you watch the movie and they're like, oh, I'm going to be able to do that. That game is so ugly and the controls are so bad. Who knew? Who knew that a licensed game was going to be bad? <laughs> oh, God. I'm I was shocked that so that happened. I was so excited, though, as a kid. Like, this is going to be <laughs> the best. 
and it just beeps at you constantly and like you hit the <laughs> ground really, really easily or anything else. And it's like all of a sudden you're like, hey, I'm good. I've got all of my armor. And, 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 you know, so yeah. Another sound bite. Uh, yeah, right. Dead, dead, dead. <laughs> <laughs> I hated that movie. So there's no mm. way I was going to play the game. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, I loved it too. For the Saturn, we have Tomb Raider, Die Hard Trilogy, NHL 97, Road Rash, and Sonic 3D Blast. For the Genesis, yes, games were still being made for the Genesis in 1997. Yep. NBA Live 97, NHL 97, Sonic 3D Blast, NBA Hangtime, and Bassmasters Classic <laughs> Pro Edition. Who the hell is renting a fishing game at Blockbuster? <laughs> I'll tell you who. Your grandpa and cousin Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> is that That's where you're like, Grandma, Grandpa, can we rent a game, please? We'll get a fishing game. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we're going to rent Bass. Grandpa wants to rent Bass Masters. <laughs> Bass Masters, the fishing show. Yeah, I know Bass Masters. Yeah, I know Bass Masters. <laughs> and on the Super NES, Donkey Kong Country 3, yep. NBA Live 97, Super, Super, Super Star Wars, Super Empire Strikes Back, and Super Return of the Jedi, the original trilogy, still banging it out on the SNES. Games released this month were Wing Commander 4, The Price of Freedom, Battle Stations, The City of Lost Children, Brahma Force, The Divide, Enemies Within, all on the PlayStation. For the N64, we had Doom 64 and Blast Core. On the Sega Saturn, we have Scud and Scorcher. It did get a wild positive review from EGM, and I don't think I've ever played Blast Corps. It, it's a great game. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not somebody who, who will tell you many N64 games are good, but that's one of them. Okay. <laughs> and finally, for all you rich kids out there, Fatal Fury Special for the Neo Geo. Now, let's take a look at some of our um, From the Readers this month. Dear EGM, I'm writing in regard to a comment made by one of your writers in his review box. In his statement, he made the remark that a particular game had less substance in it than the Pope. Well, guess what? <laughs> you have a rather irritated subscriber. Where did that comment come from? Unless one is truly ignorant of the Pope, who he is, what he does, that criticism just can't make any sense. Since I can't recall any history of this sort of thing in EGM, I'll assume the writer didn't do this in deliberate, mean-spirited manner. If indeed he did deliberately mean to use those particular words, then please cancel my subscription. Although we are all entitled to our opinions, I do not wish to contribute financially to a publication whose opinions are so contrary to the truth, a truth that I and many others hold so dearly. Oof. Okay. Get over yourself. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can't make fun of something that I love because if you do, then I'm going to cancel my subscription. <laughs> Bye. You know, but uh, I think it, this it's kid the is, truth. is it's this the kid, truth. Right, it's the truth, right? Yeah. And this kid is definitely on Twitter all the time now. I'm just <laughs> yep. going to point that out. Yep. <laughs> well, do we really think that that's a kid? I would say a younger person, maybe. I don't no. know. No. Yeah. I'm saying this person is still alive and they are a edgelord on Twitter. I yes, guarantee you. Yes, they 100% oh. are. But <laughs> okay. that sounds like that sounds like the comment type of comment that like a middle-aged person would make. How dare well, you? <laughs> this person's name is clutching. Eric Eric Freed from Sacramento, California. So back in 1997, there was an Eric Freed living in Sacramento, California. I need to find out who this person is. We internet, we need to do our thing. We're find look him me up on LinkedIn. Eric <laughs> Freed from Sacramento, California, and I want to know if he still feels the same way yeah, or if it he's would be a full-blown atheist. It would be interesting <laughs> to check in and see like how are you and the pope like are you besties or yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he invites me over for dinner and cigars. Come to find out the guy's now a cardinal. <laughs> 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 Brought out that, that magazine for his uh, his interview, right? Like, look, yep. I'm already, I'm already. You know. <laughs> well, thanks for taking a trip with me back to a simpler time. If you feel like I've missed anything noteworthy or got something wrong, please feel free to DM me at. And I'll take it under consideration. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Nice yeah. boss. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, thank you all for listening to episode 116 of Gamers Week podcast. And a big thank you to the Retro Game Club podcast, Love Retro BTW, and A Gamer Looks at 40 podcast for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to check out their links in the show notes. And if you wanted to connect with Gamers Week, you can follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Watch us right here on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Gamers Week podcast. Email us at Gamers Week podcast at gmail.com. Visit our merch store at gamers-week-podcast.creator-spring.com or if you want to do it the easy way, follow the link in the show notes. And last but not least, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamersweek. And finally, since you made it all the way to the end of the episode, please leave us a rating and review to let us know how we did. We really do value your feedback. And while you're there, considering subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. And we can't wait to hear what you think of the new format the live episodes, please let us know. We would love some feedback on these changes that we're making. Yeah. So, and thank you everybody who stopped in for the Twitch stream tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how we're going to handle this going forward with actually responding back to people who are typing in the chat. I would love to be able to, you know, read your comments on, on the episode while you're typing them and respond back to them. I'm just not sure how that's going to work. Um, right. I'm pretty sure we can, we can kind of implement that, but you know, we, we have to, we have to see going forward. Yeah. We're yep. figuring this out uh, as we go along. So feel like free to Sony, be patient. Like Sony games on steam. We're just, you know, <laughs> lying by the seat of our pants. We'll see what works. <laughs> Gamers week, the Sony adjacent podcast. <laughs> Sony adjacent. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut, patrons with benefits. This is the unscripted patron-only bonus cast with less editing and more dirty jokes. We don't know where the conversation will go, but we're sure it will be weird. This fish just went right on my nipple. And I'm just like, ah, ah, ah. I Google Street Fighter 6, the first search result that comes up is, people think they can see Ryu's dick in the Street Fighter 6 reveal. <laughs> Listen up here, kids. You're not going to want to get one of those VD, STDs things, right? Make your dick fall off. When you go, grab a pro. You'll be doing it for America. That was perfect. <laughs> If you want to hear weekly episodes of our patron-only bonus cast, join us at patreon.com slash gamersweek.